Okay, what we'll start doing now is to look at spatial autocorrelation and uh, I've divided this up into four parts. First, I'll introduce some terminology for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, basically, the notion of spatial randomness and then how spatial autocorrelation compares to that and that's probably going to take us to the lunch break and then after lunch uh, when we come back at two we'll look at specific uh, statistics for global and local autocorrelation and then end with a, a brief discussion of spatial weights before uh, we are, have the hands-on lab. So the uh, point of departure if you wish or the null hypothesis is this notion of spatial randomness and spatial randomness is one spatial analysis is not necessary and there are a number of different ways in which you can think about this and in which you can formalize this one is to just simply say space doesn't matter location doesn't matter so where a particular value lands on the map doesn't matter it doesn't provide you with any information Another way to put this is that the pattern that you observe, the map that you observe, is equally likely as any other map with the same data. So when, if you remember my example with Milwaukee, what I basically did was take the values for the census tracts and then randomly allocate a census tract to each of these values. This is called random relabeling. And so this random relabeling gives us a spatially random map. Location does not matter. Every location is equally likely. A slightly different way to look at this, and one that we will use in our operational statistics for spatial autocorrelation, is that what we observe at one location is not correlated with the neighboring value. So there is no effect of the neighboring value. And the way, the reason this is important is this gives us a hand on, on actual models. As we'll see tomorrow, we'll have models that relate observations at a location to those of neighboring locations. And then out of that model will come a particular spatial correlation structure. Um, so spatial randomness is really a situation where you can just reshuffle the data over the map and it doesn't make any difference. Okay. Um, when you have spatial structure, then this is no longer the case. Because then it does matter where things are. The location is relevant. The location provides additional information beyond just the value. And that, that is the situation that we want. I mean, this spatial randomness is just an artifact. It's, it's a point of reference. It's something that we don't want. But before we do anything, we want to make sure that we're not in this situation. So we want to reject the situation of spatial randomness in favor of structure. And that structure will be um, spatial autocorrelation. Now, it's not always that easy. I mean, this is a, an example of where I took, you know, this is a data set that um, we'll use a lot as kind of a toy data set. It's crime values in, in neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. And one of these maps is a real map, and the other one is a fake map, just as one of the Milwaukee maps was a real map, and the other one was a fake map. Now, it's, it's not that easy to just visually determine whether values are spatially clustered. In fact, it's very misleading. We are conditioned in our brains to recognize patterns. We are very good pattern recognizers. That's why exploratory spatial data analysis can be so powerful. But we also tend to see patterns where no patterns are. And so that is where the statistical techniques come in to tell us basically how likely is it that we see the map on the left under a situation of spatial randomness? How likely is it that we see the map on the right under a situation of spatial randomness? And, and where we want to be is to be able to say, well, there's a chance of one in a thousand that the map on the left is a map that is compatible with spatial randomness. Now, we're not willing to buy into this, so we say, okay, reject spatial randomness. We go in favor of structure. Now, the one on the right, on contrary, maybe 600 out of a thousand look like that. 
under spatial randomness. So then we cannot reject the null hypothesis, and then we're stuck with our randomness. And spatial autocorrelation analysis is about quantifying this, exactly this. This is where it came from, map quantification. How can you tell whether one map is random or not? Uh, to give you a sense of what these, what spatial autocorrelation looks like, what I've done here is taking a hundred standard normal variables and then created spatial patterns. The one in the middle is spatially random. The one on the right is positively spatially correlated and the one on the ne left is negatively spatially correlated. Now the way um, <coughs> We see this, and, and later on uh, we'll, we'll get further into the quantification of this. The positive spatial autocorrelation tends to cluster values in similar locations. So you see all the darkers are together, all the lighters are together. Negative spatial autocorrelation is a checkerboard path. So you're negatively correlated with your neighbor. If your value is high, dark color, the neighbor will tend to be lightly colored. And so you extend in the extreme, it is a, a, a total alteration of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Now, there's randomness involved, so it never will be quite that way. The tricky part, the challenge, our challenge is how can we quantify this? How can we tell when we get a map like this one, this is not spatially random, this is negative spatial autocorrelation, and even more so, here's a parameter that summarizes this and gives us a number, minus 0.7 or plus 0.7, as the case may be. <coughs> so positive spatial autocorrelation is about clustering. And it's very important here to see the subtle distinction between what I mentioned here on the slide, that like values tend to be in similar locations. Like values. I didn't say high values or I didn't say low values. So spatial autocorrelation is a clustering of similar values. But it doesn't have to be the clustering of the high values. This is a classic mistake. When you find positive significant spatial autocorrelation is to conclude that the high values are located together. It could be, but it could be some mix of the high values and the low values being located together. So the lows, some lows being together and some highs being together. For a um, global measure of spatial autocorrelation, there is no way to, to say this. In order to be able to distinguish between highs and lows, we need to go to local spatial autocorrelation. So it's very important to keep that distinction in mind. We're talking about clustering. There is no location here. It's the pattern as a whole. The pattern as a whole is more similar than it would be randomly. And typically, this is identified with some process of diffusion. But it's very important also to keep in mind that we don't have time. This is a cross-sectional situation. So it could be diffusion, but there are other processes that give us the same pattern. And this is something we'll talk about in a minute, is this identification problem. How can we tell? whether the pattern that we observe is the result of a contagion or diffusion process or something else. This illustrates with increasing degrees, starting in the upper left corner, we have zero spatial autocorrelation. Then we move to an auto autocorrelation of 0.5, then 0.7, then 0.9. And I challenge you to distinguish these just by eye and to be able to say, for example, that the one on the upper right is significantly more spatially correlated than the one on the left. It's very difficult to do that. And this is where the test statistics come into play, because they quantify this, they formalize this, and they give us a measure of uncertainty, a p-value, by which we can re 